It's very, very good to be together today. And I say that because when we gather, uh, God means to give us something very good. And that's something that I believe for every one of us uh, who's gathered into this room. We're here, uh, we're here right now on the verge of listening and hearing from God. Uh, we're going to spend time together in the scriptures today. And when we gather, uh, and we gather with open hearts and open ears and open minds, God means to give us something very good. And I'm very excited about today for that reason. Uh, I, I'm very confident that there's something good for each of us here today, if we'll open our ears, that has to come to us from God. Uh, let me ask you, do you know that time flies? Yes. Have you felt that? Yes. The summer? Gone. Right? Yesterday, it was sure that it was still summer, but it's, it's gone. It's, it's still fighting, but soon fall is coming. Does anybody else here love the fall? The, everyone. It's the best season, right? The leaves are changing. If you have kids, they're back at school. You get to take that sweater out and put it on. Naps on the couch in the afternoon. Fire in the fireplace. That's my favorite part. But new things begin in the fall, and that's what's happening here at this church uh, there are many new things beginning. We've heard about the small groups. Uh, there's a lot of good things starting up. Student ministries, mops. There's many, many good things beginning. Today, uh, we begin a new sermon series. And the series is on the subject of wise investment. Uh, this is what we're going to do together, starting today and going forward. We're going to ask big questions like these. What am I using the one life that I've been given for? What am I spending my energy on? What kind of future am I working at building? The, the time and the skill and the power that I've been given, no matter how small or great, what am I putting it toward day after day? What am I investing in? These are the questions that we're going to consider together. Now, when you see this phrase, wise investment, am I right to imagine that you begin to think about one thing in particular? Money? Yes? And so that means that some of you here are thinking, this is going to be irrelevant for me since I have no money to invest. Yeah? And then those of you who have money are thinking, are you seriously, you, you pastor boy, are you seriously going to come and tell us how to invest our money, churchy? We'll stick to the Bible. There's those two things going on. And let me tell you, very, right up front, first of all, this subject of wise investment is relevant for everyone. And that's true because investment is not just about money. I'm not going to try to tell you how to invest your money. This is not a financial seminar. But I will ask you with me this week and in these next five weeks to think together about how am I investing the resources which I do have. Investment is the activity of taking some asset or some good that you possess and setting it aside or putting it to work in the present for the sake of a future benefit. You, you have something now and you choose to use it in a specific way now so that later on you'll have some good which you wouldn't otherwise get. And you can apply that, of course, to investing money, but you can also and should also apply that to every resource you have. Time. Time flies, and time is one of the most valuable assets that you have. And do you know that every day and every moment, you are choosing how to invest the time that you have? Do you see that? Have you ever gotten through an hour or two and then suddenly realized, what did I just use those last 120 minutes for? Has that ever happened? It's a bad investment in time. This happened when you first discovered YouTube. <laughs> And not just that, but so many other activities, and some of them are good. We need a break now and then, but so many ways that we choose to use our time. At the end of it, we might say, that was a bad investment. Because after time has passed, and we're now in the present looking back, we will always have the ability to reflect and then say, did I invest that time? Did I invest my energy? Did I invest my will or my strength? or that relational capital that I had? Did I invest that wisely or poorly? Because the question about investment that we're going to consider today and moving forward is what does it look like to invest wisely? Now, I want you to be clear on this one. Uh, I have my own ideas about investment, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. 
But I have not come today, and will not come in these coming weeks, with my ideas principally, but with the ideas that come from Jesus. And I know that in this room there are people in different places with regard to faith in Jesus. Some of you have been and are committed followers of Christ, and when you hear the words, Jesus, you begin to to recognize the promise and what's coming next, and others might not be in that place. But what you will see if you will apply yourself to listening today and in these coming weeks is that no matter what your faith is, you are constantly making decisions about how to invest what you have. And many of the decisions that we make are unwise. And if we will, this is my faith speaking now, if we will attend to Jesus, he will show us the path of the very best investment, the wisest investments that we can possibly make. And so we're going to begin this entire series with one scene in which Jesus is teaching. That will set the the stage for the next five weeks. I want to set that stage with you first, and then today we'll briefly consider our first investment opportunity, and each week after that we'll come to another. And the text that we're going to look at, the text, boom, wake up, the text (laughs) comes from the book of Matthew in one of the most... Uh, the the fullest and most extended teaching moments in Jesus' career, in what you may know of as the Sermon on the Mount, if you've heard about it. If not, and if this is new to you, I want to invite you, before we read, to use your imagination to picture yourself where this was taught. Imagine you are living in the first century, and and into your village, a, a small crowd comes, and at the head of this crowd is a teacher, and you learn that his name is Jesus. I want you to imagine this. No matter what your faith is, imagine that there you are and this teacher comes into town and there's a crowd around him and you decide to set aside what you'd been doing that day. You decide to put your plans aside and use the time you've got to go check out what he might have to say. You see, that's an investment. I'm going to invest a half an hour here. And as you listen to him, the way that he teaches, the way that he carries himself, the kind of personality he has, which is so open and gracious and wise at the same time, it makes you decide to put off the rest of your day's activities and stay with him all day. And you do. And you find yourself wandering to the next village. And as you go along, you hear this man teaching in a way that you've never heard before. Can you imagine that? Uh, Maybe you've had a a person teach uh, where it opens your spirit in a completely different way. Imagine that's happening for you. Uh, so compelling at the next village that you decide to make uh, a phone call back to, to the, you know, your, your contacts um, and then you're going to put off your work for tomorrow and the next day. You send a few emails and, and you text. This is called an anachronism. So, right? You send a pigeon back to the village and, and you, you, you say, I'm going to go with this guy for a few days and see what happens. And as the time goes along, you realize this is a great decision because of how this man is teaching. Now the crowds are building. Now there's hundreds of people that are gathering around like you to listen to him because of the words that he shares. And then, surprisingly, this is imagination, he takes you aside and he says, listen, at the end of today, I'm going to go up that mountain there. I want to take some time away from these crowds and this valley below, and I want you and your friends here with you to come with me. I have something really important that I want to open for you. Come with me. Would you want to do that? I would really want to do that. Mountains in this first century environment are, because they're physically closer to the sky, were understood as holy places. Jesus is inviting them to leave all of their cares, all of their distractions behind, and come into God's presence in a new way and listen. If you've read the book of Matthew, you know it begins with his name uh, being declared as Emmanuel, God with us. You are invited to listen to the words of God with us. And so you climb up the mountain with all the others there with you. You get to the top, everyone's quiet, and you're filled with anticipation. What might he say to me that I need to hear? And then after sitting down, he begins to speak. And you can read, by the way, the the Apostle's recollection of this teaching begins in Matthew chapter 5, and it's filled with gems. And I want you now to see the words that he shares somewhere in the middle, and I've selected them today because they're about investment. Look at what he says in chapter 6, verse 19, there on the mountain with you listening. Here's his wisdom. Listen. 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here in the center of his great teaching, Jesus describes a process of storing up for oneself treasure. Another word for that is invest. Picture it, a a, a man or a woman gathering treasure and storing it. They're putting it aside in the present so that later on it will give them the ability to do something which they believe is valuable. In the present, they've invested in this opportunity so that in the future there will be something good for them. And Jesus speaks of this with the disciples on the mountain, with you, because he understands that the way it goes in life is that every man and every woman will have to decide how will I use the energy and time and all of my resources in the present as I plan and think about the future which is ahead of me. You do that whether you're aware of it or not. Every decision that you are making with your energy and your skill and your time is an investment decision. And Jesus wanted all of those disciples to come to the place where they could see that for all of them, it would either be one way or another when it came to investing. And on the mountain, the way he distinguishes between the two possible ways is with these two phrases. Either you will store up for yourselves treasures on earth or treasures in heaven. Now, you might be inclined to imagine treasures in heaven means good things that will come to me after I die because I was behaved well now. That's not what Jesus is talking about. It becomes more plain when you think about the first category, treasures on earth. What is a treasure on earth? Uh, it, it's not hard to envision when Jesus describes it as that treasure which is subject to the decay that comes from moths and rust. Or that thing which can be stolen by a thief. Obviously, this includes precious things like gold and silver and jewels. All kinds of good and fine objects of material value. And you don't need me to tell you that lots of people work really hard investing everything they've got to gain material wealth and possessions, do you? You know that, right? Here Jesus tells these disciples that it is not a wise strategy to work yourself to the bone in order to acquire things. And he gives a hint as to why. They're subject to decay. They're temporary. Their value is fleeting. And here we have a window into a second understanding of treasures on earth. It's not just fancy things. It's any value that we assign to something that is temporary, that goes away that promises to give us true life, but doesn't deliver on its promises. And when I describe it like that, there's an awful lot of other things that are treasures on earth that you can think of. Here's one that's obvious, I think, fame. Fame is a treasure that drives so many people crazy. They do everything they can to get it. But then they acquire it, and it doesn't deliver. It is a fleeting treasure. One hit wonder. You with me? Right, there's all kinds of examples like that where someone acquires fame and then they remain the emptiest and hollow person because even if fame does last, which it never really does, it doesn't deliver. And there are many other treasures on earth like this. Here's another one. Receiving praise from your friends or your peers. Anyone here driven by pleasing people? How's that investment working out for you? It's not a good investment. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. He is telling those gathered around him not to invest in these kinds of things for one reason. Now, please hear this. This is extremely important. He's telling them they shouldn't invest in those things because he loves them more than they can possibly imagine. He brought them with him up that mountain because he is desperate to see them have true life and good life because he's that consumed with care and concern for them. Whenever Jesus forbids a person from doing something, it's not because he's a killjoy and he wants to keep them from having some good. It's because of how deeply he loves them and he understands how 
foolish we can be and how easily tempted by things that have no value. And because those kinds of paths ruin us, Jesus says, do not go on that path. And that's why he's telling them this and us this. Don't invest in treasures on earth. Invest in treasures on heaven, he says. What does he mean by that? It's not just good things that come to you when you die. It is those treasures which, unlike those material possessions that we are so driven to acquire, have eternal value that are spiritual goods, that are heavenly in their qualities. Some of them may be material and others may not be. Let me give you some concrete ideas. How about good relationships? Have you ever invested in a good relationship and then experienced the benefit of it down the road? Is there anything so good as that? I mean it. Think of it. It might be love, a romantic love. It might be friendship. It might be the benefits of being a parent in the best possible way and down the road seeing the payoff as your children begin to grow and impress you with who they are. Those investments are heavenly. Those are the kinds of things that are, fall under the umbrella where Jesus is teaching these disciples about investment. Treasures on heaven, the, in heaven. The kind of value that comes from God's wisdom is what he's speaking about. Things that are worthy of this one life that you've been given. Things that you can put yourself and your resources into so that there will be a day when you look back and you say, it was so good that I disciplined myself, that I chose to put those resources aside in that time so that I could acquire this very good thing for me now. And good not just for me, and this is very important for any Christ follower, good not just for me, but for the people around me. And if you study Jesus' life, you'll see him constantly investing himself in eternal, spiritually good things so that it would be good for him and the people around him. He is our teacher today, and it's his vision for how we should spend the lives that we have that will guide us today and on into these next weeks as we think together about investing in ways that are truly good. And today, this is transition to the first subject. Okay, today we're going to consider one investment and we're going to do that as we are guided by a book right in the center of the Bible in the Old Testament, a small book called Proverbs. Um, am I right to assume that some of you are familiar with that book? Yes. Would, would one who's familiar, would you shout out the central theme of the book of Proverbs? Be brave. What is it? Wow, that's a lot of you. Okay, great. So if you're thinking, I know it already, I don't need to learn you're a fool. <laughs> and that's what Proverbs says. All your life long, you should be a student, Proverbs says. Oh, there are so many wise things in the book of Proverbs. And I want to help you see with me one moment where in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is presented as the best possible investment. And then the author says why it's the best possible investment. And then we're going to think about how to get it. Those three things. Wisdom is the best possible investment. Why is it so good? And then how might I acquire wisdom? Those are the three things I want us to do with Proverbs. Let's get into the text. I want you to look with me now at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding. For her income is better than silver and her revenue better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called happy. These words are poetry, lifting the virtue and value of this singular thing, wisdom. And they're beautiful. And when you dwell on them, their meaning unfolds and presents propositions and then support for those propositions which are profound and moving. Does anyone know who wrote these words or who they're attributed to? Solomon. The book begins with a description of the wise sayings of Solomon, and that matters for a reason. At the center of what I've just read is this singular proposition. Nothing 
you can desire compares with wisdom. Nothing at all. And I'm sure there are many things that you desire. All of us have desires. It's a truly good and human thing to have desires. This person says, of all the things that you can desire, nothing is better than wisdom. That doesn't mean he's saying you shouldn't desire other things. But the very best desire, the first desire, in effect he is saying the most important thing for any one of you to invest in is wisdom. And he says in, in, in a very profound way that wisdom is actually better than the three most valuable things he can think of, gold, silver, and jewels. Wisdom, according to Solomon, is has a better income, has a better revenue, and is more precious than those very precious and very valuable and very revenue-generating things. And at the start, I want you to see with clarity this man's assertion that when it comes to investment, there's nothing better for you to invest in than wisdom. I want you to imagine for a moment that God himself appeared today and said to you, Let's make it later on today, all right? You're lying down at the end of the day. You're worried about work. You're figuring out your tasks. And then all of a sudden, God appears to you and says, hey, well, maybe God wouldn't start with hey. It would be something more formal. (laughs) (laughs) Greetings. Okay. And then, listen, I want you to imagine this. And God says, tell me what you want. I'll give it to you. Anything at all. I know one of you is thinking, I would ask for three more wishes. (laughs) This is not a genie. I want you to envision God, God himself, the creator of everything, comes and says, you tell me the one thing that you want. This imaginative exercise, it actually happened to the author of these words, King Solomon. His father was king of Israel. His name was David. The family system that Solomon came out of was messed up. Anybody here have a messed up family system? (laughs) And those of you who are sitting next to your family, you're not free to raise your hand. (laughs) His family was so messed up. And his life unfolded in a way that put him in the position of recognizing that now he was going to have to take over for his dad as king. And he was vexed by the possibility. All of the things that he had to worry about were so overwhelming for him. And you might not be king, but you still have stuff to worry about. Am I right? That life still is difficult and pressing, and it was for him. And he went to sleep one night, and God appeared to him in a vision and said, Solomon, you ask me for what you want. I'll give you anything. And Solomon could have asked for anything, but he thought in his own mind about What would be the best thing for me to have? Yes, he wants pleasure. Of course he does. We all want that. Yes, he wants rest in his life and sanity. He wants security. He wants to be honorable and have a life that's filled with honor. He wants material possessions that give him comfort and and the ability to enjoy his days. He wants all of that, but instead of asking for any one of those things, his reply to God is, what I want from you more than anything else is wisdom. Give me wisdom. Wisdom. And he asks for it for a reason. And this is a great reason. He says, I know that I need to govern your people, and I don't have what it takes, so would you give me that so that I have the capacity to do what you've made me to do in my life? You may not know this, but God has made you individually to do something wonderful with the life that you have. God had a very beautiful design for you personally. Even if you don't believe that, I'm telling you that it is true. And the reason that Solomon asked for wisdom is he believed deep down that there would be nothing better for him to have. There's nothing better to invest in than wisdom. And I'm sure that the same is true for you. That's why I've chosen this at the start. Because all of the good things that you desire cannot compare to wisdom. That's the first thing I want you to see. Now, there's a reason why Solomon says this with such clarity, partly due to his experiences, but he unfolds those with poetic images here that give us an answer to this second question. Why would wisdom be the best investment? I want you to look again with me at the words there in verse 16 uh, and 17. And again, this is poetry, so let your imagination envision this. Long life are in her right hand. As an aside, the Hebrew and Greek word Wisdom is feminine, and so poetically, it's easy for this author to envision wisdom as a woman. 
And he's just now depicted for us a woman who is holding something in her right hand and something else in her left hand. Imagine that, would you? In her right hand, long life. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways, and here you're meant to envision a path, a journey. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Imagine there is this woman there holding these two things, these three things which you yourself want. Long life doesn't just mean many, many days, but the Hebrew would have understood by the word life, tov, the kind of existence that matches God's plan. And that is in wisdom's hand. Peace and pleasantness, those things that you and I were made for, for pleasure, for the easy, relaxed pleasure of a life that is good. That also is her prerogative. She is the one can sh- that can show the path. She's the one who holds riches and honor, the, the riches and honor that you want truly, not false riches, but the true riches that human beings were made for. And the reason that wisdom is the best investment is hidden in this image. Think of it with me for a moment. If you want riches, let's start there. This wise man is saying, don't go chasing after riches because the one who holds riches is wisdom. So if you want riches, go to wisdom. You see that? If you want true life, don't go chasing after true life. Go chasing after wisdom because she's the one who holds it. If you want true pleasure... Don't go running after whatever presents itself to you as worthy of yourself and therefore pleasing, but come to wisdom because she'll show you the path of true pleasure. She'll show you the path of true peace. In effect, the reason that Solomon is saying that wisdom is the best investment is that all of the good things that you want will not be had by chasing after them, Wisdom has them, and when you find wisdom, you will get all of those other good things. You hear that? One of the things that most people want, in my experience, is to be happy. You've heard that, right? The first words that I read to you in verse 13 are, happy are those who find wisdom. If you want to be happy, don't chase happiness, because you will become desperately sad. Because without wisdom, you'll have no idea where to find it. The same goes for all of the things I've mentioned. Here's a simple example. Have you ever met a terribly wealthy person by material standards who has all of the material possessions a person could have, and yet they're dreadfully unhappy? That they have no idea how to use their wealth. That they use it in a way that destroys them and the people around them. Have you seen stories like this? That's because they chased money and not wisdom. The person who's wise and becomes extraordinarily materially wealthy can do wonderful things in the world with their wealth. And if they had wisdom first, their wealth would be put to good ends. You see how how Solomon supports the idea that the best possible investment is wisdom because it's just that good for you. Listen to some of the other things, by the way, that come in the book of Proverbs about the subject of wisdom. Here are the other benefits of this investment, according to Solomon. When you lie down, if you are wise, your sleep will be sweet. Isn't that beautiful? You've had those really sweet nights of rest, haven't you? And on the other hand, you've had those tortured nights of tossing and turning, but you you can't get any rest in your soul. Wisdom makes sleep sweet. The wise, here's the second one, sit down at the end of the day and they are not afraid. You know what it's like to be afraid of things, right? Of things in your past or the things you're facing in the present or the anxiety of tomorrow and down the road. Solomon doesn't say, if you're wise, nothing bad will ever happen to you. But he says, at the end of the day, you will not be afraid. Because wisdom protects you from that. Wisdom gives the wise security, the ability to walk on every path without anxiety because the presence of God is there to protect. Happy is a word that comes up over and over again in connection with wisdom. Wisdom leads to a good reputation among the people around you and before God so that you become a person of influence. Wisdom makes for a straight path rather than a crooked path. It makes you able to understand righteousness, justice, 
equity, and every good path. It makes it so you know what steps to take next. There's nothing so good as wisdom because it puts you in the place of living truly. Does anyone here know the opposite, how bad it is when you are foolish? Would anyone else admit to that? I would. You look back on the, the places in life where you've suffered misery, where you've brought it on, and you can easily say, I was a fool. If you can't say that, you're twice the fool. <laughs> That's the second thing that I want to see you to see with clarity, that this best investment is best because of all the things it results in. I know someone might be thinking, wait, what about investing in knowing Jesus? In, in submitting yourself to him by faith. There is... Of course, that is, listen now, the wisest thing that you can do. And I am confident that anyone who sets out on the path to become wise will sooner or later be confronted by the living Lord Jesus Christ, whose benevolence will say, you are welcome now to receive the wisdom that I will give. Will you walk with me? And that brings me to the third thing that I told you I would say about wisdom, which is to answer the question, how do I get it? Okay, if I've done my work thus far well to tell you that this is the best possible investment and then to show you all of the good that comes from it, every one of you should be ready to say, all right then, how do I get this investment? Yeah? You're on the edge of your seat, metaphorically. All of you are sitting back. There's a few of you dozing. Come on, are you ready? <laughs> yeah? How do I get this? It says there at the start again that when you answer that question, you will be what this sage calls happy. Happy are those who find wisdom. Where can I find it? Here's where I get very practical and completely concrete. Three, three things I'm going to tell you about how you can get wisdom. Here's the first one. You will find wisdom if you apply yourself to understanding the Word of God. I say apply because that takes work. What I mean by it is when you start to open your mind and focus your attention on God's word and come to it with an expectation that you might learn something that will make you wise, you will begin to grow in wisdom. You, you, some of you might say, I don't have faith yet. I'm not sure what I think. I don't know where to begin. This is very practical. Begin in the book of Proverbs. The, the one that we've already spent some time in together. There are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. There are 31 days in many months. So what you should do is each day choose to read the chapter of Proverbs that comes from that day of the month. So today you're going to read chapter 13. Some of the things you read in one chapter, they won't connect with you. Some will confuse you. But I guarantee you, you will come across aphorisms, clever sayings of the wise that will strike you deep down as true. This is right. If I would internalize this, it would make a difference. Do that day after day. In Proverbs chapter 2, so next month you'll get to the point where there, there's another exaltation of wisdom, and the author says... If you apply your mind, if you incline your heart, if you seek eagerly, if you cry out for wisdom and lift your voice for insight, all of those verbs depict someone who's hard at work, focused, and actually doing something productive. He says if you do that, God will give wisdom. So the first thing I can tell you is if you would work at growing in your understanding of the word. And if you don't know where to begin, I've given you the book of Proverbs. Go to the New Testament and read through the book of James. You can dwell on Matthew, the material I gave you there. But work, I, investments, this is me putting on the investment advisor cap, okay? I feel like I should give a disclaimer. Don't invest because I said this, but do invest. It takes time when you invest, doesn't it? Someone who's invested money, help me out here, doesn't it? Yeah, it doesn't come back instantly, and if it does, it's probably a dangerous investment. But this is an investment of your time and your intelligence and your work, and it will pay off. Psalm 119, filled with brilliant insight about the wisdom that comes from investing in knowing God's word in Scripture. The unfolding of your word brings light. It imparts understanding to the simple. That's the first one. Here's the second one. Uh, the second strategy I have for you on how to get wisdom is to seek the wise counsel of people who you know who are wise. Now, some of you are thinking, all of my friends are morons. <laughs> okay? 
be gracious with them, okay? Maybe add another friend or two. <laughs> Find someone who you know is further along on the path of wisdom than you are currently. And I, I'm sure that's true for every single one of us in here. And I'm almost tempted to say, except for the wisest person, one. But even the wisest person can grow by spending time around others who have the gift of wisdom in ways that they don't. And so this really is a pitch for you to stop being alone in your discipleship and start being together with others. And then with those others say, I don't know what to do here. Would you give me some advice? I have no idea how to face this next challenge. Do you have any insight for me? And some of you who are young and don't have wisdom, I love so much that you come to church. It makes me so glad. Adults, the fact that we have people who are younger than us who are in this church is the most beautiful gift. Young people are amazing and so wonderful. Oh, I want you young people to find someone who's wiser and older and come up to them, even if they're a stranger, and say, hey, your hair is gray. I think you must be wise. <laughs> Would you? It says that in Proverbs, by the way. Gray hair is the crown of the wise. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's time for you to stop coloring your hair. <laughs> Go up to some of them and say, I, I, I need wisdom. Would you help me? And then if you are an older person in this community... Go find someone who's younger and make a relationship with them where you begin to impart some of the wisdom that you have and you know that you're really lost in lots of other ways, but do that. And you watch if they don't give you some wisdom. Listen to some of the words that Proverbs writes about the wisdom in others. Without counsel, plans go wrong, but with many advisors, they succeed. If you have a big decision to make, a vexing problem before you, seek the counsel of a lot of people. Don't just do everything they say, but seek counsel. That will help. Those who ignore instruction, this is uh, 1532. Those who ignore instruction despise themselves, but those who heed admonition gain understanding. If you are not teachable and don't want to learn from the people around you, this sage says you hate yourself. Here's 1920. Listen to advice and accept instruction so that you may gain wisdom for the future. The best investment is wisdom for the future. Find those around you who can help and ask them. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to advice. The person who says here, I know enough, I don't need to learn anymore, that's a fool. The wise are those who say, I'm ready again to gain in, in wisdom so that I know how to move through life well. How shall you do this? Uh, okay, remember now, the first advice I gave you was read the Bible. Here, be in relationship. Go to a community group. You saw that video. You, you've heard us talk about it. This is a shameless plug for community groups because I have no shame at all in plugging them. It would be so good for you to go. If you are wise, go and share your wisdom. If you are a fool, go and gain wisdom from the others. Go to these groups and grow in wisdom. It is the best investment that you can possibly make. If you want to be happy and, 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 and understand pleasantness and grow in peace, then seek wisdom. Here's the third thing that I want to say about it, and this is the last thing. Review. Learn God's word. Seek the wisdom of the people that are around you. Here's the third one. If you want to grow in wisdom, ask God to give you wisdom. Or the story that I shared there about Solomon is a story where Solomon doesn't decide after a, a good sermon to go off to the library and start studying. God says, what do you want? And Solomon says, I want wisdom. Give it to me. And God gives it to him. Maybe you know the book of James. That's another book I suggested. It starts in the first chapter with a sentence that says, do any among you lack wisdom? Answer collectively, yes. Let that person ask God who gives to all generously without withholding. That's a promise from James. But it goes on to say, but let, let her ask in faith. Not doubting. And it's easy to read this as like a formula. If I pretend that I believe God's going to give it to me and ask in faith, then he'll definitely give it to me. And then you ask, and why didn't it work out like that? I tried that many times when I was younger. Okay, it doesn't work. <laughs> Asking in faith 
is trusting that what God says is trustworthy, that I'll put my faith in it. And then when you ask, God always gives the wisdom that you need, not if you're not going to trust. And, and it's actually easy to see this. Imagine a young person asking a, an older person for w- advice. I don't know whether to take path number one or path number two. And let's imagine that wise person knows exactly which path to take. And when the, when the wise person says, you should take path number one, imagine that young person walks away and says, yeah, but I really like number two. It's so shiny and exciting. I'm going to go down number two. Have they gained any wisdom from that interaction? No. But if you come to God and ask for wisdom and are ready to trust what God unfolds for you, you will gain wisdom. And there may be many things right now that you don't have any idea what God would want you to do in in regard to those subjects. Set those aside. I'm absolutely sure that there is something in your life now where you know, I'm sure that this is how God works. Ask for wisdom, and then when that, that, that way of God comes into your mind, do what you know God wants, and then you will grow in wisdom. And when you grow in wisdom, these two things, when you grow in wisdom, you will grow in true life. You will have ways that are pleasant. You will grow in peace and in happiness, in joy. It will be a benefit for you that will make you say one day, I am so glad that I invested in wisdom back then. I'm so thankful that I made that investment. That's the first thing. And then here's the second thing. And this to me is equally or maybe even more important. When you grow in wisdom, it will be good for the people in the world around you. And that's what the church is supposed to be for. For building up men and women like us, not just so that we have some benefit over against others. God help us if that's our attitude. If that's our attitude and we are sitting on the mountain with Jesus, the one who gave himself fully for the world around him, then we haven't heard anything that comes from his life. But if we're ready to let him remake us and turn us into people who are wise, then we will be ready to be used up in the world for good for the people around us. And trust me now, the one thing that the world desperately needs that I see with such clarity is wise men and women who know how to diffuse difficulties without resorting to violence or name-calling or categorizing and dismissing, who know how to bring love and joy into a land that is so dry and desperate for, for those things that it makes us imagine that it must be at an end. That's what the world needs. And so when you grow in wisdom, you become that. This, my friends, is the deepest rationale that I have, the, the reason for me to, to invest myself in these coming weeks in this subject with you. It's so that Park Church together would be growing with men and women who are individually growing as they learn what to invest in, but then together collectively and as they are dispersed so that we would become the light that the world needs, the salt that Jesus spoke of, so that we would be the blessing in the world around us that God envisioned when he called Abraham and sent him out into the world to be a blessing for others. If we will grow in wisdom, and here's my final word, this last poetic image is what the author of Proverbs here, Solomon promises. Look at verse 18 with me. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called happy. The tree of life is an extremely important image in Scripture. It's used very, very infrequently. It's used four times metaphorically in the book of Proverbs here once to describe what it's like for the person who grasps a hold of wisdom, like a man embracing a woman. The other places where this image is used, you may know, are in the very opening words of the Bible when the Garden of Eden is described where Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, are together and they are free of shame. They love being with each other and completely open. They have nothing to hide. And they're there with God in God's presence and they have everything they could possibly dream of or desire right at their fingertips. And in that place, there is a tree called the Tree of Life. And then the the tree appears again at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation when the new heaven and the new earth is described. When you and I are given a vision of what to expect in the future when God comes and redeems and restores and the tree of life is there again. 
and those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, those who are justified by Jesus and washed clean, those who have come to him and said, I'm ready to receive the gift of wisdom. Give me that gift so I live well. They are also there in the presence of the tree of life. The sage is saying, if you want not just good things now, but the eternal joy of fellowship with the living Lord, unhindered, and free and gracious openness to God and he to you, then come to wisdom. Because when you embrace wisdom, you receive a tree of life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, in these weeks ahead of us, what we want very much is to learn how to invest wisely. We want to see... What are those things that we can put our resources into now so that we grow and the future benefit for us and the world around brings glory and honor to your name? We want to strive to use the time we have, the energy, the skill, the will power that you've given us, the money that we have, all of our relationships, all of our resources in a way that builds your kingdom in a manner that is good for you and those around us. God, we want this very desperately. I ask now that the time that we've spent here would be building us up already, that we would know better now than before how to follow the paths toward wisdom. And God, I ask that for every one of us, you would give us what we need to grow in insight and understanding. God, thank you. Thank you so much for meeting us as we spend time in your scripture. I thank you for every man and every woman in this place this morning. I thank you for all of the children you've gathered together. Would you please develop us so that we become a powerful resource for your kingdom initiative in this world. We ask in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.